Hey folks, Cameron Gaskell here and welcome back. Now by now you've gotten to watch a video of me doing a rehab from start to finish. You've got to see the numbers and how everything works. This time I'd like to go over something different. I'd like to go over contractors. Really I want to go over how to deal with contractors and how to qualify them and how to find them. It seems to be a big problem that a lot of people have. So I want to go over that with you right now. Now one of the things I want to ask you is what does a good contractor even look like? Alright, you ready? That's it. That's a good contractor. Well, I know that you probably can't hire me if you don't live in the area, but seriously, how do you really find a good contractor? Or where do you find them? There's a couple places that you can go. One, go find other real estate investors and just ask them. You know, who do you use as a contractor? But one of the things I want to say is don't get upset if they don't tell you who they use. Because they might use a contractor that can only handle one house at a time. And if that's the case, they're not going to tell you who it is because they don't want their contractor getting busy with your jobs. But don't get offended by that. That's just the way it is. Now, you might find somebody who uses a bigger contractor who has multiple crews or something like that, and they can handle a lot, and they would be willing to share with you who it is. But you've got to ask. Now, here's something else you should really ask. Ask who not to use. That's a real big one right there because there's some bad contractors out there and subcontractors alike. You want to find out who you need to use and who you need to stay away from. So ask that question when you're talking to other real estate investors. Another thing is you could go to your local RIA in town and you could go to the meetings and ask around. Ask who the contractors are. They probably have vendors on their list who are contractors who rehab houses. They might even have roofers and plumbers, electricians and things like that. So anytime, no matter what town you're in, Check the RIA groups, check the meetup groups, stuff like that, and ask and get referrals that way. Another thing you can do is you can go to the supply houses. The big box supply houses, they know who the rehabbers are because they're the ones that buy a lot of materials from them. So what you do is you go to the contractor sales desk and you just ask them. You say, I'm a real estate investor and I'm looking for a contractor that can rehab my houses. Do you know anybody that I should call? Trust me, they know who the good ones are, so they'll tell you. Just all you got to do is ask them. Another thing you can do is, have you ever driven around and just seen a dumpster in the driveway? We all have. Well, that's usually a rehab going on over there. Don't be afraid to pull up, go up to the door and ask who's in charge, who is the boss or who is the superintendent, and ask them for a business card. Here's the really good part about doing it like that. When you get to go to these houses, what do you get to see? You get to see the work. You get to actually see what's going on. You can see the quality of work. Are all the guys there, are they working? Are they sitting outside smoking cigarettes and not actually working? Does the quality look good? Does the order of the rehab look like it makes sense? You know, you can really get a lot of information uh, from driving to a job site. I have gotten a lot of trades, subcontractors and stuff just by pulling up to job sites that I've seen. Uh, another thing you can do is you can ask city inspectors. The city inspectors know pretty much all the licensed contractors in town. And they know the good ones and they also know the bad ones, so you can ask them. Another thing a lot of people don't think about is ask another contractor. So if somebody came to me and said, do you know of somebody who rehabs houses, I would probably say, yes, I can do it. But if I was too busy, I know plenty of other people who are decent and good that I would refer to. So don't be afraid to ask somebody else if they know anyone. Uh, Angie's List and Craigslist. You can find people on Craigslist, but be careful when you do. There's a reason why they're on Craigslist. If there's a contractor or subcontractor who's really good at what they do, their phone's ringing a lot more. They're getting a lot of referral work. They don't really need to advertise on Craigslist. So if you're having to go to Craigslist to look for people, you want to kind of just screen them a little bit more than maybe you would a referral because if they've been in business for, say, 10 years and they're still on Craigslist looking for work, that might not be a very good sign. So you really want to look into that. Another thing you can do is go to the home improvement stores and, and just see who's there in the mornings. And you're going to see all the contractors going in there, buying their materials, and you'll see their signs on their trucks at the, uh, at the lumber area where they pull in and get all their materials. And you can get their numbers off of their truck. You can go up and talk to them. But here's the key. Don't go there at 10 o'clock in the morning looking for a contractor. That's probably not the one you want. You want the contractor that's going to be there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Because if you find the one at 10 o'clock in the morning, that's what he's going to do on your job. He's going to get materials at 10, he's going to show up at your house at 11, and he's probably going to leave at 2. So you really got to think about it. So you got to wake up early in the morning, go over there, get there at 6 o'clock in the morning, and start looking at all the trucks, go inside and get some business cards. You'll find some good people that way. Now, once you've found some people, you need to pre-screen them. 
and I don't care if you get contractors, if you get subcontractors, even if you want to just hire a handyman, you really need to pre-screen them. You can check on the Better Business Bureau and see how they do there. Make sure you always ask for a copy of their license and their uh, workers' comp insurance. A lot of workers will use workers' comp exempt forms. Now, don't be fooled by this when they tell you they have a workers' comp exempt form and they've got a couple employees. You cannot do that in the construction industry. You have to have workers' comp if you have at least one employee or more. Now, if the person works by themselves, they can be exempt. I personally, as a business owner, I will not hire a subcontractor with a workers' comp exempt form because if something happens, I want to make sure that workers' comp is there to take care of it. So I only hire people who have workers' comp uh, insurance. You also want to make sure that they have general liability insurance so that way if somebody comes onto the job site and gets hurt, that's going to get taken care of. If they flood the house or anything like that, you want to know that the general liability policy is going to cover the repairs to fix it because sometimes the contractor is not going to have enough money to do that themselves. And obviously you want to make sure they have some kind of a license. If they're just a handyman, you want to make sure they have an occupational license. If they're a specialty uh, person such as a roofer, a plumber, a contractor, then there's a special license they should have by the state. You want to make sure they have that. Not that they have, just that they have that, you want to make sure that it's, that it's in good standing, that they've renewed it when they were supposed to. And that's very easy to do online to find out if, uh, if they've updated all their information. Also, when you do find a contractor, make sure that you can get at least three references. If you hire a contractor or a subcontractor and they tell you they don't have three references, it might not be the best contractor to use because you want somebody who's done at least three jobs, right? I mean, you don't want somebody to be the first job is yours. You want them to have several. So make sure that they can give you some references and some phone numbers, and you have to actually call those references, okay? You want to find out what people thought about them. Did they do the job good? Did they do it on time? Was there any problems of any sort? And uh, people will tell you when you call them. Also, the city building inspectors ask about their workers, um, their workmanship. Ask how it is. If they, you know, do sloppy work, do they pass their inspections when they uh, when they call for their inspections or not? So you need to find that out. And also, you can call supply houses and ask, you know, what they think about the contractor or subcontractor that you're talking to, and ask, do they pay their bills on time? You know, you don't need anything in specific information, but you know, do they pay their bills on time? Because if they don't pay those bills on time, there's probably other things they're not doing on time, and they might not be paying their employees on time either, which really could come back and bite you. So you can also check with that and get some good information. Now, when you do finally settle on who you want to use, there's a few things that you need to make sure that they do. Now, you want to make sure that they always sign an independent contractor's agreement. Always. It doesn't matter what they say. You want to make sure that they sign that. You also want to make sure that they can pull and pay for all the necessary permits and that they can pass all the necessary inspections. And that means that they're licensed. They have the proper license to be able to do that. Uh, you want to make sure that they will agree to a detailed scope of work and a materials list. Now what I mean by that is you're going to have to give them the scope of work. You need to tell them this is the stuff that I want you to do. You are responsible to finish X, Y, and Z and they have to agree to that. Now the part about the materials list means you might have certain things you want. There's certain tiles, there's certain uh, fixtures, lights, fans, things like that. You want to make sure that they agree to buy the things that you want. Uh, you also want to make sure that they keep the job site clean every day. I'm a real stickler about that. When people come to a job site and it's dirty, they just don't get a good feel about the job. And also, it never looks like you're close to being finished when it's always dirty. Uh, and also, you might have potential buyers come into the house. You might have realtors come into the house. You may have um, somebody else. It just doesn't matter. You don't want to take a chance on missing out on a deal or having somebody get hurt because you have a job site that's not that clean. So make sure that that's a must. Also, you want to make sure that they'll agree to paying a $50 to $100 fine per day for every day that the job is late. And I mean the finished day. Okay? So, now, on this one, if the... If the contractor does a job, and let's say they finish the job two or three days later than they said they originally would finish, should you really ask for them to pay that? I probably wouldn't. It's not made for that. It's made for the contractor that's going to finish three, four, five weeks late, who's going to leave your job and go work on another job for a week or two and leave yours sitting there. You want to avoid things like that. 
So when you put in there, you're going to pay me a fine if you're late, they'll usually make sure to stay on your job because that's one thing people don't want to do. They don't want to pay more money out. Um, also, make sure that there's a transferable warranty. And what I mean by that, so like say you have a roofer and they put on a roof and then you sell the house to a retail buyer, you want to make sure that that warranty can be transferred over to the retail buyer. Your contractor should also warranty his work, at least warranty his labor. So if he does something and then the new buyer moves in and something breaks down, you want to know that your contractor is going to go out there and take care of it. You also want to make sure that they'll agree to a small deposit. Now read my lips, small deposit. Nobody should be asking you for half their money or more to start a job. There's only a couple of exceptions I can think of. The roofer, and that is because most of the money that you're paying is actually going towards the materials, the roof. Uh, an AC, a brand new AC, most of the money is actually going to the AC. So there is an exception on a few things. Granite tops, most of the money actually goes to the granite, not the labor. There's a few times that, yes, you will have to probably pay half up front, and that's okay. If you have a contractor that's rehabbing a house, you have a plumber, electrician, anything like that coming in, you should not have to give them all this money up front. The materials don't cost that much, okay? So the question is going to be, well, then how much do I give them? Well, it really depends. Jobs can go uh, differently. Let's say you have a $10,000 rehab. I would probably break a $10,000 rehab into halves or into thirds. Um, if I had a thirty, forty thousand dollar rehab, I'd break definitely break it down into thirds. Anything in that's more than that, I would break it up into four payments. So let's say you had a fifty thousand dollar rehab. I would tell you that I want twenty five percent up front. How much is that? That's twelve thousand five hundred dollars, right? So I'm going to get that up front. That's going to make sure that I can get my materials. That's to make sure that you're serious. That nobody's going to do something they shouldn't be doing. Now. As far as when are the other payments due, that's on the contract. You do not want to go into a contract without knowing exactly how the whole, um, the whole thing is going to happen. You want to know when the payments are going to be made and how much each of those payments are going to be made. So for example, if I was doing a $50,000 rehab, I think it would take about six weeks to do a rehab that size. So what I would do is I would say I want every two weeks I want a payment or every three weeks I want a payment. That payment would be of $12,500. So I would get it up front. <clears throat> I would also get it after three weeks or two weeks. On the fourth week, I would get my third draw. And then on the sixth week, I don't get my draw on the sixth week. I get my draw when I am finished with a job. And finished to me is when the customer or the homeowner or the uh, real estate investor says it's done. In other words, I finish the job. I tell the owner I'm finished or I tell the customer I'm finished. They come and walk it. Once they walk the job, they tell me if they found anything they want me to fix. If they did, I make those, uh, I fix those things first. Then I call them back and say, come back out again and do another walkthrough. Walk when they do that next walkthrough, if they say, yes, I'm finished, then I'll ask for my check. I never ask for my check until the customer is satisfied that I'm 100% complete. And you should do the same thing. And here's why. If you pay somebody that last draw, you will probably never get them back to fix anything. They're going to move on to the next job because it's a psychological thing that in their head, they're now coming back for free. They're working for free and nobody likes to do that. So you always want to make sure you hold something. Always make sure you hold something and never pay them until you know it's completely finished. And here's another thing. Don't pay anybody anything without a lien release. If you're giving them a payment, you want to do a partial lien release. Once the job is finished and complete, you do a full lien release. You always want to have them uh, fill one of those out. You can find those online everywhere. Uh, it's kind of like a trade. You hand them a lien release, they, and your, they hand you their lien release, and you hand them a check. It always works like that. Every time you hand somebody a check, you should be getting that lien release uh, for that. Because what that says is they've been paid, and they have paid the proper people, such as their materials people, uh, as well as their subcontractors, as well as their materials. Um, if they didn't pay any of these things and somebody comes back on you, you can show the lien release and say, yes, I did pay that person and they claim that they paid you. So it will help you if you ever have to get taken to court or somebody puts a lien on your house. Always do that. So you want to make sure you set expectations. Now, one of the things is contractors are like, we're like kids. We are. We have to be trained. But the thing is, we want to be trained. We want to be trained because we need to know what your expectations are. 
If you're real picky about paint, I need to know that. If you're real picky about timing, if you're real picky about cleanliness, I need to know what it is that you're real picky about so that I make sure I take care of that on every job. I need to know if there's certain things that you want. So don't be afraid to tell <coughs> the contractor exactly what you want. Uh, you need to train them. So, also, remember, no big deposits, ever. Always keep the deposits short. Manage your contractors. you got to manage them, okay? They're like children, but you still have to manage them. And have really good communication. You need to make sure that you're not afraid to talk to your contractor, and vice versa. So if you're afraid to call your contractor and tell them something, that's probably not a good contractor to use. So you need to make sure that you, uh, that you have good communication with them. All right, now, you need to make sure that you do a few things. You need to make sure that you inspect their work, especially if you've never used these people before. You want to go to the job site on the first day, maybe the second or third day. Make a couple of times that you go out where you check on their work and, and check on the quality and everything. And as you build trust, you can go and start checking less and less. But you always want to make sure you check on them once in a while. But if they're new, you need to check on them a lot. You've got to do it. Never pay more than the work that's been completed. Okay, in other words, don't pay 95% of the job and have only 10% of the work done. We talked about that earlier. Make sure you don't get over on that. You need to make sure you receive change orders. So you need to tell the contractor or the subcontractor, you need to tell them, if you're going to do something that's not on my scope of work, I want a written change order and it has to be signed by myself and the contractor stating what's going to be done when it's going to be done, and how much is it going to be done for. Once it's signed, then that work can be done. If you do not do this, you're going to end up with a job that you're finished with, and you're going to get a final bill with a whole lot of extras on it that you weren't aware of, and it's going to really mess up your budget. It could even make it to where you don't make any money on the deal. So you've got to set that expectations right away with your contractor. Always get the release of lien. We had talked about that a little bit earlier. And then getting three bids, I want to talk about this for a second. Everybody always says, get three bids. That's fine, and I agree with that to a point. Here's an example. When you get your first house that you need to rehab, and you're going to call three contractors to get three bids, how many of them are going to get the job? One, right? What happens to the other two guys or girls? They don't get the job. So you get the second rehab. What do you do? Do you call the same three people? If you do, you have a 90 to 95% chance that you're going to hire the same person that you hired in the first house. That's fine, but you've told somebody or two people no twice now. So what do you do in the third house? Do you go out and get three bids? If you do it a third time, you're probably going to lose those two contractors forever. They're either going to be unavailable the next time you need something, or they're going to really price your job super, super high because they know they're not going to get it anyway. So you got to be careful with that. Here's why. Let's say that you get that contractor A does the first three jobs. Now on your fourth job, contractor A is no longer even available. Maybe he's just busy. He can't get to your job for a month, and you don't want to sit there for a month. Who are you going to call? Are you going to call contractor B and C, the ones that, that you told no to two or three times? And then if they bid the job, are you getting a fair bid now? So be real careful with that. What I would suggest is if you use a contractor and you're going to keep getting bids, maybe you give one of those other contractors a chance to do the job. You might even find that if you do that, that contractor B was better than contractor A. You just didn't know it. But he was a little bit more expensive. But you had less headaches. He was always there on time. He ran his jobs better, stuff like that. So it's always to have, good to have more than one trade, more than one contractor in your back pocket when you're doing rehabs. You're going to find that that's going to really help your business, especially if you want to grow and start doing multiple houses and stuff. Uh, asking for discounts, you want to be careful asking for discounts because uh, if you ask for a $5,000 discount from a contractor and he says yes he can do that, that probably wasn't the right contractor. He should have never had that much uh, profit built into it. Average profit for a contractor really should be about 10% of the job. So if you're asking for more than a 10% discount and they say yes, you're being overcharged. Uh, if they say no, that they can't do it, it's probably because you're asking them to take their, uh, their profit away, and that's not going to work out too well. But most of all, you've got to make sure you have a lot of fun and enjoy what you do and go out and make lots of money.
So I hope you liked the tips that we had for today. I hope to see you back on the next video. You guys take care. Be careful of those contracts, those contractors, they can be pesky out there. So guys take care. I'll see you again. Bye.